And now, if you'll turn with me in your copy of God's Word, uh, we're going to be continuing in our series, A King and His Warning. This morning, we're going to be continuing through Matthew uh, chapter 7. We're going to be starting in verse uh, 14. As you're turning there, if you know me at all, you'll know that I don't post on Facebook much. But in recent history, what I've found is that when I do post on Facebook, it makes me more grateful that I get to be one of your pastors because generally the responses and comments that I'm getting, majority of them are coming from people that uh, call Exodus home. Uh, and so my last post, and this is proof I don't post often, was on June 4th, and I posted a picture of a small brown snake that I saw slithering outside uh, the side door of our house. And I, my post was a picture of the snake, uh, and I said, the, the caption was, what kind of snake is this? Question mark. Here's some of the responses that I got, most of which coming from you guys. So I'm not going to name names, but some of you are sitting in here. So here we go. What kind of snake is this? I I included the picture. Uh, A brown one. Uh, A live one. Parentheses, it should be a dead one. Uh, A gross, vile, this is all the same comment. Gross, vile, disgusting creature. A result of Eve eating the apple in the garden. (laughs) I love, I love our church and they get theological, even on Facebook, right? Uh, a danger noodle was one of my personal favorites. <laughs> and, even a, and then someone responds to that with a picture of noodles up against a picture of a snake. Uh, someone said a draft snake. And then uh, we get a brown earth snake, which I think was somebody trying to sound more educated on snakes than they actually were, but it's a good try. Um, one of my favorites, because this is a really typical southern response, if you're from around here and you see a brown snake that doesn't have a rattle on the end, you automatically assume it is some kind of copperhead, um, which was this, some kind of copperhead. <laughs> and then finally, we get the right answer, a northern red belly snake. Now, the conversations, the comments from that were, were hilarious. They were a blessing to my heart, so much that I've read them more than once. Um, but if you go back and read them, if you've got nothing else to do, go knock yourself out. But there's a father and a son who throughout that thread are trying to help everyone else actually find the right answer to the question. These guys, I've known them both for years. They're actually snake experts, if, if you will. And, and throughout the thread, it's like everyone's making jokes and then they kind of swoop in and kill the humor by saying, no, 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 this is a snake. This is a noodle. You should learn the difference. But in the end, the, the father actually made this post, and I'm going to read a direct quote, right, the, the party pooper of the Facebook thread. It says, snake identification is a serious subject. An incorrect identification could spell danger to humans and unnecessary killing of snakes. Now, I mean, if you're like me, I don't have a strong opinion on snakes one way or the other, other, other than I would prefer not to get bit by one. But what we can see in that, what we can see in that, that conversation is a need to be able to distinguish one thing from another. Even more seriously, the need to be able to distinguish the right from the wrong, the safe from the dangerous, the true from the false. And this morning, as we near the end of what is called the Sermon on the Mount, we're closing in on the end of our series of King and His Warnings, that's what we see Jesus doing. Jesus is warning us. He's, He's calling us to be aware of what is false so that we can take hold of what is true. One writer, a man named Sinclair Ferguson, says this about our passage this morning. This section is about choices. It's about not being deceived. In keeping with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is vigorously underlining the difference between what things may seem to be and what they are in reality. There's always a certain appeal in the broad way in the false teacher, and the immediate success story. But what we need is to be warned by Jesus that the principles on which the kingdom of God is established are very different. And that's what we need to see this morning, is that Jesus came to make us, to, to give us what is true, so we must be aware of what is false so that we can hang on to what is true. We have a warning this morning. But what I want us to see is that a warning from, from God is much more than stay, simply stay away from what is dangerous. And that, that is part of what he's doing. But when Jesus warns us against something, it's because he's ultimately trying to push us towards something else. And so this morning, what we see Jesus doing is warning us against what is false because he wants to give us what is true. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. We're going to go through verse 23. I'm going to read, we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump into God's word together. Let's look at the text together. And Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. 
but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful that you brought us together. I thank you that you've given us your word so that we can know what is true and we can know what is false. Lord, do you want to give us what is true? And what we see, though, in this passage this morning, Lord, is there, is there is weight and consequence to mistaking the difference. And so, Lord, that's what I pray this morning. You'd make your truth clear, and that's what we would be drawn towards. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is offering us what is true this morning. And as we said, we're going to primarily see that through him warning us against what is false. But there's three things that we see him giving us true things that he's giving us in the text through these warnings. First is true teaching. The second is true fruit or good fruit. And the third, which is, is where Jesus is driving us towards, is true hope. So the three things Jesus wants for us this morning, true, true teaching, good fruit, true hope. And we're going to see that, see him offering those things to us in the way and in, in what he warns us against this morning. So first, true teaching. Look with me again at verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. So where is Jesus offering us true teaching by warning us against wolves in sheep's clothing? First of all, I want to say this. This is one of those passages that if you've grown up around the church or grown, in, or grown up with some Bible knowledge, this is one of those passages that un, like unintentionally a lot of times I think produce paranoia in us versus caution and awareness. When Jesus says beware of, what he's not saying is be afraid of. What he's not saying is, is be paranoid about or, or sharpen your pitchforks and be on the hunt for wolves so you can poke them when you spot them. He's not trying to produce fear. Again, he's pushing us towards the truth. So where do we see this offer of truth? Well, um, two, two things to start. So when Jesus is teaching, one of my seminary professors would say, that it's important to see what he's explicitly saying, and it's also important to pay attention to what he's implying. And we see two implications in this first verse and a half that, that we need to acknowledge before we can understand who these false prophets are. The first implication is this, that Jesus is warning us against what is false because there is something that's true. Jesus is warning us against something that is false because there is something that is true. Now, that may seem incredibly obvious, but you have to, to bear in mind for just a moment that the culture that we live in, some would call it a postmodern society, which just means that truth is subjective. We can't really know. Like, what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. But actually, a lot of social commentators since 2017 have actually said we've moved from, from postmodernism to something called post-truth, which actually means the, the, the short way of understanding that is that emotions and feelings now take the priority when... when establishing things over actual facts. So we've actually gone further than postmodernism, if that was possible, to a post-truth culture. And what is more offensive than anything, right, if, if you're asking for the opinion of the masses, right, the, the most offensive thing you can say is that I'm right, I know what's true, and what you believe is false. In fact, some people go as far to say, well, Jesus is loving, so Jesus wouldn't be judgmental like you are. But here's the problem with that. We know Jesus from what the Bible says, right? Jesus says the Bible is about me, and Jesus would not be warning us against something false if there wasn't a truth on the other side of it. So that's the first thing I want us to see this morning, church, is, is he's giving us truth by warning against what is false. The, the implication in him warning us against what is false is that there is truth that we need. And when it comes to matters of God and eternity... What Jesus would actually tell us is that you're not being judgmental or academically behind the game to say there is one way, nor are you being disrespectful or devaluing of another human. You're actually being as loving and as respectful of that human as you can possibly be because you're trying to give them what they need most. 
So first, Jesus is implying there's truth that he came to give. So he's warning us against anything that would take us from that. The second implication that I want us to see about these false teachers is that we're inclined to listen to them. Right? Jesus isn't assuming that we're dumb. But all throughout the Bible, Jesus calls his people, and and God, in the Old Testament, uh, all throughout the Bible, God refers to his people as sheep. Implying that they need to be led. They need someone to take care of them. Sheep are inclined to follow. And they'll follow just about anything. And so Jesus is saying, you can know the difference between truth and false prophets, but you've got to remember, part of being on guard is understanding your own inclination to listen to false prophets. Jesus being on earth in this point in history is proof enough that we fall victim to false prophets because he's there because we had spent hundreds and hundreds of years listening to false prophets and false teaching. And we this morning are no different. So those are the two implications. There is truth objective truth that Jesus came to give, and we're inclined to be swayed by false prophets. Now, that gets us to who, this, this question of who are or who is the false prophet or the false pro- who are the false prophets that Jesus is talking about. And this morning, what I would encourage you to think around is more of the what versus the who. It says you'll know them by their fruit. Now, fruit, we generally hear and we think moral living, which is part of what fruit means. But when you're talking specifically about the fruit of a prophet, or your translation may say teacher, part of their specific fruit is what comes out of their mouth, what they're teaching. That is a characteristic of a prophet or a teacher. That's what a prophet's job was, was to come t- take the words of God to the people of God, simply put. And so part of the fruit, and we'll unpack more of their fruit in just a moment, but part of the fruit of a false prophet is what they teach. So who are they? First, you'll recognize them by their fruits. That would be what they teach. I'm going to read to you a couple different passages um, from from the Bible because this isn't the the only time, it's not the first time, and it's not the last time in Scripture where Jesus says, or, or the apostles or Old Testament prophets say, beware of false prophets or false teachers. So I'm going to read a few passages, and what we'll start to see is there, there's common threads that, that help us understand who these false prophets are. First, look at ten, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read them because there's, there's several. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they'll have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Matthew 24 says, For false Christs and prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have warned you beforehand. 1 John 2.22-23 says, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges, acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Romans 16, 17 through 18 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles, contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So who are these false prophets that we've got to be aware of? One one writer on this passage says, you can actually find the short answer to that question by looking back at Matthew 7, 14. I'll read the first part of it. It says, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. False prophets, in short, are anyone or any organization, any teaching that promotes another way other than the narrow way. That's your short answer. That a false prophet or false prophets, false teachers, are anyone who promote another way to life, not of life, to life, other than the narrow way given to us in Matthew 7, 14. And here's something I don't want us to miss, church. When Jesus says, narrow is the way. We and hard is the way that leads to life. We're inclined, if you're like me, you're inclined to hear that and, and, and think moral tightrope. The way is narrow because there's a certain way I've got to live. I've got to keep it straight. I've got to keep it clean. And the way that you live matters, right? Jesus makes that clear. But the way isn't narrow because of morality. That's not a morality statement. The way is narrow because there's one way. Jesus said, I am the way. The way is narrow because there's one way. It's a sufficient way, but Jesus is the way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It's Jesus. And so a false prophet is anyone, anything, any organization that says that there's another way other than Jesus. So let's unpack that a little bit further. 1 John, the passage we read, 1 John 2, uses the phrase antichrists. 
Right? We, we, if, you know, if you've heard the term, you've been in church, you would generally think the Antichrist is one person. First John says an Antichrist, an Antichrist is anyone who says that Jesus was not the Son of God, that he didn't come in the flesh, that he didn't die on the cross, that he, he didn't rise from the dead. Reverse that. The gospel is this, that Jesus came to save sinners. We were separated from God. God sent his one and only son into the world. He lived a real perfect life here on earth, died a physical death, and then rose again, and is the only way back to the Father. That's the gospel. Anything other than that, add to it, twist it, take it away, shift it, you're an, you're an antichrist, a false prophet, or you're believing a false prophecy. That's who the false teachers are. It's not so much the who, it's the what. What are they saying? What are they teaching? It's something other than who Jesus said he was and what he came to do in the Gospels. Now, as we've said, we're inclined... To false sway to it. We're inclined to listen to false teachers. So here's just a few examples of, of false teachers, right? If you consider the moment in history when Jesus is preaching the sermon, it'd be the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But again, it's not the who, it's the what. What were they teaching? They were teaching that by your race and by your obedience to certain man-made laws and, and your adherence to certain standards, you could clean yourself up enough to get to God. And that the Messiah wouldn't be a carpenter's son from Nazareth who was going to die on a cross. He would be some kind of political leader that did what we wanted him to do. That was their message. That's what qualified them as false prophets. You've got all kinds of world religions that we don't need to get into. But they can be categorized into this. Right? Whether it's a world religion, whether it's a philosophy, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. False teachings right, is anything other than who Jesus said he was. And we, we're inclined to, t to take hold of them for one reason or another. Either A, because it says there's another way. It's more comfortable, right, to say the way is broad, it's not so narrow, right? So it's not, it's all, all paths lead to God. Or it's some kind of worldview or a version of the gospel that keeps things in our hands. Or another religion says, you know what, it's, real, it's still really up to me. So the way is broader than it actually is, or they'll, they'll convince you that it's really still up to you, and we're attracted to that, we like being in control. Or third, false gospels tend to, to place their hope around circumstances, over eternity. And what does Jesus say is the result of that? It destroys, right? He, that's what he tells us about their teaching and about their desire. They're inwardly, they're ravenous wolves, right? Only, you got to watch like one episode of Planet Earth to know about wolves. They're hunters, they're dogs. They've got one MO to eat. And they're going to hurt and they're going to wound and they're going to destroy if that's what feeds them. And so Jesus isn't saying be afraid of them or be terrified of them. He's saying beware of them. Know that they're out there. Be ready for them because I came to give you truth and what I don't want is for you to be pulled away from that. So how do we prepare for them? Now, I love apologetics. You want to have coffee, we'll talk apologetics. I'm not saying you shouldn't go study other world religions. I'm not saying you shouldn't pick up a, a copy of how to do apologetics. I could recommend some books you want to talk after the sermon. But in the text this morning, you know what Jesus is saying? is the best defense, the best way to be aware of, to be ready for, to do battle against false teachers? It's to know him. It's to know the narrow way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To keep consistent with the language of, of wolves, Jesus says in, ch in John chapter 10, wolves are going to come and they're going to seek to destroy my sheep. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give my life for the sheep. So our defense, right, Jesus is warning us against one thing. So that we can take hold of what he's offering to us, the true way, the true life. And ultimately, he's telling us that, he's pushing us to that, so that we can bear good fruit. And that gets us to our, our next point, that Jesus came to give us true teaching. He also wants us to bear good fruit. You will reckon, look at verse 16 again. You'll recognize them, that's talking about the false prophets, by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Now, it's one thing to talk about false prophets and teachers. The text now becomes more uncomfortable because we start talking about if, if you're not bearing fruit, then you're chopped down and thrown into the fire. And it would be easy to dismiss that. Well, they're just talking about the false prophets. But we can't just dismiss it and say it's them, not us. For two reasons. One, <clears throat> because fruit takes time to grow. Fruit takes time to show up. And oftentimes, 
one type of, of fruit, right? Jesus is using agricultural language on purpose. These are, these are people that would know farming. One thing will look like something else for a certain amount of time. In fact, when he says, you will recognize them by their fruits or grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, one commentator points out that from a distance, blackberries growing on a buckthorn bush might resemble a grapevine. Or the flowers that grow on thistles would look from a distance like budding figs. And so it takes time for them to show up. It takes time for them to, to be in full effect. You've got to be closer to them. I mean, Jesus says they're going to come to you. Like, he's using the language that he's using about them being in sheep's clothing because they're, generally speaking, they're going to they're, they're be present in and affect God's people. They're going to show up in and around the church. And it takes time for things to show up. My, uh, we were in South Georgia this past week on vacation. My father-in-law has decided he's going to plant an orchard um, of various fruits uh, and on their, their property. And so when we, we got there the next morning, he was excited. He, he said, man, did you see my fruit trees? I've got apple trees. I've got fig trees. I've got lime trees. I'm like, I saw them. I don't know which one is which, because right now they all look like sticks coming out of the ground with green leaves coming off of them. It takes time, right? Unless you're a master arborist or a botanist, like you, you're not going to recognize them at first. And as we've already seen, oftentimes, because false prophets and, and the fruit that they bear shows up in the church, it's, it's, not, it's not so clear cut right at first. But here's what I want us to see. Jeremiah 14 14 through 16 says this. It gives us a couple criteria to, to measure the fruit. It says, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I've not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the, the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, No sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. A few things that we see from that passage. So what is the fruit that we're looking for? If it's, if it's easy to miss, if it's easy to be deceived by. And it says, because they'll even use Jesus' name. But one, they're prophesying to you false visions and divinations. They're saying things that aren't true. They're either promising things in the future that they don't have the ability or the authority to, to promise... And, and if you read other parts in the Old Testament, that's how we're, you tell a false prophet they're going to say something that's going to happen, and it doesn't happen. But that's a characteristic, that they begin to teach things, they begin to make promises that they, aren't, they don't have the authority or the ability to make and keep. They start to trust their own minds and their own sayings over what the Bible actually teaches. When it says idolatries and the delusions of their own mind, they find whatever it is, whether it's a certain way of living or their own opinion, they, they begin to elevate things. That's what I, I, idolatry is, is, elevating things above where Christ should be. And so idolatry is a symptom of that. Elevating things that, that aren't taught in Scripture as non-negotiables, they make those things non-negotiable. And then they, pro, when they are overly optimistic, generally speaking, speaking. That's what he said. They'll say there's no sword or famine will touch this land. They don't have the ability to to stop that from happening. They have no way of, of make, controlling that. So the fruit of false prophets, they eventually, they become more important. The individual, the, the preferences become more important than what God teaches. They say things that aren't true, and then they begin to make promises that they can't keep. Now, it would be easy to say, okay, I won't listen to false prophets. They'll be chopped down and thrown into the fire. But... This isn't the only time that Jesus talks about not trees that, not, that don't bear fruit get chopped down and thrown into the fire because you will bear the fruit of the prophets that you listen to. You will bear the fruit of the teachers that you trust in. Who you believe in, that will eventually flower out of you. What is planted in you is what's going to come out of you. And so he's not simply saying you'll know them by their fruits. He's saying if you follow them, you're going to bear the same kind of fruit. And oftentimes, what you're going to see that fruit come out when you find success, when you face trial, or when you're challenged. Success, is it more, are you more humble and more generous, or are you more prideful and more angry and more demanding? When suffering comes, do you have a hope that you run to, or do you become depressed and angry and blame somebody else? When you're challenged, if you're wrong, are you quick to repent? 
Because bearing fruit isn't just about morality. There's plenty of world religions that you are a good moral person if you follow those teachings. This is about what comes out of you as a result of who your trust is in. Jesus came to give true teaching that we might bear good fruit, that we would reflect Jesus because our hope is in Jesus. Which leads us to where I believe Jesus has been driving us in this part of Matthew 7 because he wants us to have true hope. Look at me at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, we should feel some weight with what Jesus just said. He's talking about giving us the true teaching so we can bear true fruit. And then he drops this just massive ending to us where he says that you could say to me, Lord, Lord, and you'll prophesy in my name and you'll heal in my name and cast out demons in my name. And then I'm going to say to you, I never knew you. So when we say Jesus is offering us true hope, what we're talking about is, is eternity. When Jesus says on that day, that phrase that day, Jesus is always referring to judgment day when he uses that term, on that day. That's, that's an end times statement, that when your life and eternity meet the, you know, hit head on in the inevitable collision course that you're on, you'll say, I did all these things, and he'll say, I never knew you. So where is the hope in that? Because we were talking about bearing fruit, well, Lord, Lord, that's that's not accidental. He's saying people will use the, that they will know my name, Lord, Lord. They will call me what they're supposed to call me, which means they've got the right head knowledge. They'll be passionate. They'll serve. They, they, will, they will do things in my name. That seems like fruit. But then I'll say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. And this is what Jesus has been pushing us to, is to have true hope on that day. And here's where it comes from. First of all, it's not enough to, it's, it's not enough to simply know the truth and to be passionate and to do things based on what you know. And at the same time, as a Christian, that's what you should have. You should have solid teaching. You know the gospel. You know who Jesus is. You know who God is. You know his word. And that drives you to be passionate and that drives you to serve in his name. But again, Jesus is warning us against what is false and what is true. And as we've said, being able to distinguish the difference leaves us with eternal consequences. And so where is the hope and how do we know? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we do not prophesy in your, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? The back at verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father. And that's where we see the difference. What is the will of the Father? Scripture would say to love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Several different places in the gospel says the will of the Father is that you would believe that Jesus is the only Son of God. And by believing in him, you would have life. God says in John in, uh John 3, 16 and 17, Jesus came, and by believing in him, we'd have eternal life. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. The will of the Father, a pastor says this, that the difference between just like being told by Jesus that I never knew you and, and being welcomed in on that day is not a question, because if you're like me, you'd hear that and be like, I've been, like, as a young Christian, this passage terrified, and it's like, I'm never going to be able to do enough. It's not about doing enough. It's a question of lordship and a question of dependency. The will of my father. First, the question of lordship. The ones who did all these things, and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Think back to Matthew 6. Jesus says, hey, when you do these things, assuming that people are going to do them for one reason or another, don't do them like the hypocrites. He's addressing the pretenders, the people that, that took what God commanded them to do and did it, but did it for the wrong reasons, or even did it thinking that they could, they could be enough on their own. Whatever it was, they weren't doing it because Jesus was their Lord. They were doing it because they were, they were trying to accomplish something 
on their own, which leads us to the other thing. It's a question of dependency. Yes, we need to know. Yes, we need to serve. But we're not doing it to earn. We're doing it because Jesus has already earned it for us. The, the fear in that verse is he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Here's the hope in this. Paul says in Galatians, also addressing a church struggling with false teaching. He says, because you're his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you're God's child. And since you're his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather known by God. Jesus came to give us true teaching that we could bear good fruit so that we could have true hope. In summary, that comes from knowing him and depending on him, saying, yes, I know you're the only way, and you're the best way, and placing your hope in him over and over and over again. And so what do we do with that? This morning, the application is really simple. Know God and be known by God. If this morning you came not sure where you stand, it is, Jesus is not offering an invitation to be morally cleaned up. Yes, he calls you to live differently, but what he's offering you is a chance to be made right with God and become family, the eternal father, by doing nothing except depending on him and letting him change you from the inside out. And if you do know him, continue to know him. That is the will of the father, not simply to do it once, but to continue to know him and to depend on him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for coming to bring us truth, for calling us away from what is false that we might have eternal life. Lord, I pray that 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 would be true of us, God, that we would depend on you and we would come to you and we would seek to know you and and be known by you over and over and over again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.